Hello everyone, welcome to the very first webinar of 2014 for the Multiscale Modeling Consortium. I'm very pleased to introduce uh, Dr. Uh, Teresa Pitts. Uh, Teresa is um, uh, graduated from the University of Florida with her PhD um, in um, communicative disorders and respiratory physiology. She is a certified speech language pathologist, um, and she has been working on uh, airway protection in the coordination of cough and swallow. She's currently a research assistant professor at, in the Department of Physiological Sciences at the University of Florida in Gainesville. And today she will be presenting to us her new K99 ROO otherwise known as the Kangaroo Award from the NIH. Um, this award is called a, 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 a um, uh, Regulation of Airway Protective Behaviors. And Teresa's talk will be on um, in vivo and in silico models of airway protection. Thank you, Teresa. You can go ahead. Well, thank you so much. I really appreciate um, you having me here today. So I'm going to start. Um, kind of with this idea that this grew out of things that I saw as a speech pathologist, things that I saw um, in the hospital. So I'm going to present some of the human data that was gathered during my PhD and kind of how we're moving towards new mechanistic approaches for airway protection with in vivo um, studies in animals and some um, in silico for computer um, simulations, computer modeling. Okay, so swallowing is this complex coordinated behavior, it's more complicated, the longer I study it, the more complicated it, bit it gets. But essentially, you have to have some sort of afferent feedback, which, initial which initiates and can modulate this reflexive behavior. So you can touch or put pressure, or you can have a bolus, which is essentially just water or food. You can put it on the tongue, the fascial pillar, soft, pal soft palate, all the way down to the junction of the pharynx and or the esophagus, and you can induce a swallow. And this crosses multiple cranial, multiple cranial nerve afferent beds, and all of these afferent beds can initiate swallow, some with a higher degree than others. It has three phases. The oral phase is the mouth chewing, the tongue movement, and the pharyngeal phase is as soon as the bolus is moved um, past the edge of the jaw, then the pharyngeal phase is initiated. And then you have the esophageal phase, which kind of um, has more sympathetic control take over. And this term dysphagia would be disorder of swallow. So this is um, an x-ray video that I'm going to show you of an ALS patient who's getting what's called a rehab swallow study. So this is in the hospital how they decide if a patient has a swallow study. So here's your esophagus and your larynx here. The first swallow goes very pretty well, and then here you can see the second swallow, all of this aspirated material. I'll show you that one more time. So this first swallow goes pretty well, and then we're going to watch here. This is the larynx entrance down to the lungs, and you can see all of that material and passes down in there. And so the idea is that when we evaluate them for dysphagia, one of the big complicating factors is whether or not they cough in response to that aspiration. And so this ALS patient did not. So now you have a concomitant of disorder, one being a disorder of swallow, and secondly, now this disorder of cough. So cough is a protection behavior, protects the pulmonary system by generating these high expiratory airflows that create a scrubbing action. Essentially, you have this very high linear airflow, about three-fourths the speed of sound, and it aerosolizes what is in the airway and moves it out. And so you have classically have three different phases, an inspiration, glottal closure, which is closure of the larynx. So the larynx then closes, you have pressure that's built up underneath, and then you get a forced expiration. So over here, you have a normal patient. This is airflow over time. And so you can see this negative inflection here would be the inspiratory phase. And you have the compression phase here, which is adduction of the vocal folds, and then this expiratory phase. And so we're calling the disorder of cough um, dystocia. Okay, so we do take cough measures. Um, 
and they've been defined in some of the things that we've published, but we're looking at classically the inspiration, the compression, and the expiration pay, um, phase. We're interested in the maximum peak flow that's produced. We're interested in the time it takes to get to that maximum peak flow. Um, and then we're interested in something called cost volume acceleration, which is the peak flow over the rise time. This gives us some metric of how effective a cough actually is. But now in humans, we have this added disadvantage called gravity. And so this is just a, an idea of, of how when you move from animal to human, you have some additional factors. Okay, so this Ross paper was really fantastic in kind of beginning to explain what's happening against gravity. But what we have here is mouth. Um, down to the lungs of the alveoli, and this patient has aspirated something, so we have some sort of liquid down at the alveoli. And so as a cough is produced, you have this theoretical equal pressure point. Um, so north of the equal pressure point, these, um, this is going to be aerosolized and removed. South of the equal pressure point, you are going to have um, compression on this alveoli here. And so then as it produces the squeezing effect during that compression, then it can be removed on the next cough effort. So humans actually cough not inspiration, compression, expulsion, but they actually begin to cycle between compression, expulsion, compression, expulsion to lower and lower lung volumes, which allows for greater clearance against gravity. So here we have our compression in the alveoli, that liquid is squeezed up, and then it's removed on the next cough. So you have two patients where we began to look at Parkinson's disease in humans. What's nice is that Parkinson's disease deteriorates rather slowly. So they're a nice human model to study degeneration of diseases. But most of this started back with Carol Smith Hammond. This is um, figures from the, pu from the publication in 2001 where she was looking at stroke patients and she's beginning to um, in humans show this correlation or sh show this relationship between cough and swallow. So here you have a patient with, with no aspiration on their swallow study um, and they have a nice, you can clearly define all three phases of the cough. We have a nice expiratory peak flow. Here's a patient with mild aspiration and now this cough is already beginning to look at a significant disadvantage and now it's severe aspiration. I, I think even me um, I would have a pretty difficult time assigning the phases of cough and because the peak is so far out from the end of the compression phase, um, the clearance of this cough would be um, rather minimal. So we, I essentially followed the path that Carol Smith Hammond lined out and we were looking at Parkinson's disease patients which were non-dysphasic, so they were normal on their swallow study, that's over here on the left, and then a patient who was dysphasic, so showing um, significant penetration or aspiration during the swallow study. So we can see that just looking at these two different um, figures that there is going to be pretty significant change when you add swallow. So we look at group differences comparing dysphasic and non-dysphasic patients. What we see is our dysphasic patients, their compression phase is getting significantly longer. Their rise times are getting significantly longer. Their expiratory phase peak flow is getting, is much shorter, much less, and thus they have a less effective cough volume acceleration. So overall, their, um, their coughs are getting slower and they're less effective. We then went on to do another um, paper showing that you can actually take these objective cough metrics and use them as a screening tool to actually pick out the patients in the population that we had thus far and say which ones were going to have a swallow problem and, and which ones were not. And so in some of those publications at the end of my um, PhD, we were trying to give clinicians, um, speech language pathologists, but anybody who's kind of seeing these patients who are at an airway protective deficit, give them some objective metrics because at this point we don't have a lot um, of information to give clinicians on how these behaviors are interacting. So. Following my PhD, I began my postdoc in the, um, in the laboratory of Don Bolser and who studied the central control of cough and somehow I convinced him to add swallow to the protocol that we were doing as well. And so 
what we're trying to do is, is approach this um, more mechanistically, give us more information about how cough and swallow should interact, um, especially to minimize ongoing aspiration risk. So we have an anesthetized model. This is 17 animals. And we did direct needle EMG into muscles that work kind of on all parts of the swallow. So laryngeal elevator muscles, the muscle that actually closes the vocal folds off, and then um, pharyngeal muscles that control bolus movement, the bottom of the pharynx, and then muscles that actually open the upper esophageal sphincter. And so we devised this aspiration protocol. And essentially what we did was we um, looked at each, both cough and swallow in isolation. And then we did a trial where cough was mechanically stimulated. And once um, three coughs were um, produced, then we injected water in the mouth. And then we looked after this water injection at how cough and swallow were coordinated over time. OK, so here is an EMG example of a swallow. And so one of the things that we notice is that you get this cascade effect that as you kind of move down from the mouth to the lower pharynx, that these muscles activate in this sequence. And then here we have the cricopharyngeus. This is the upper esophageal sphincter, and you can see that it actually relaxes during the swallow. The parasternal is an inspiratory chest wall muscle, and so this is a little um, Activation of inspiratory muscles, the diaphragm does the same, but it helps to produce this negative upper esophageal, I mean, esophageal pressure inflection. And so we're essentially, like I said, recording down this pharyngeal phase sequence for a swallow here. So now for cough, we're looking at um, muscles that control where the larynx is, closure of the larynx. This is opening of the larynx. And then rectus abdominis being an abdominal muscle. And then the parasternal, which is an inspiratory muscle. And then if you look down esophageal pressure, what you see is a negative inflection for the inspiratory phase, and then a positive inflection for the active expiratory phase. So here is an aspiration response protocol. So cough has moved along up here. We inject water in the mouth probably about this point because we have this significant change in um, UES tone. And now we can see that there's a swallow. Here's a cough, a cough, a swallow, and then a cough and a cough. And so what we're beginning to use terms like meta behavior to describe this aspiration response, that these behaviors are not solely individuals at this point, but they're working together in this coordinated um, manner to clear the airway and then reduce any ongoing aspiration risk. And so we have this hypothesis now that the brain stem is actually sorting through this competing stimulation, and it's choosing to express one behavior over the other. And then we're also really interested in how excitability can be modified on a cycle-by-cycle -cycle basis to help maintain a clear pharynx and an open airway and clear what has been aspirated at that point. So here we have some of the results from the swallow. So what we see here is increased pharyngeal clearance. So we have a significant change in the swallow duration. So we see a decrease in swallow duration. Here's our total swallow time here. For cycles that were combined, this is the water and the TB is just um, stimulation of the tracheobronchial tract. And then we also have a significant increase in the swallow amplitude across most of, most of the muscles that we recorded from. Specifically, these pharyngeal muscles were having a real significant change. So we're beginning to think um, about the more complex pharyngeal anatomy. Um, the pharynx is not just a straight tube. It's kind of an interesting place, but it has these pockets, um, which they call sinuses. And so there are two sinuses kind of up right behind the tongue that are called the vollecula sinuses. And then down right at the junction between the phary pharynx and the upper esophageal sphincter, just on the outside of the larynx, are these piriform sinuses here. And so during swallow, we had a real understanding that they work um, that they work to hold a bolus 
um, before the full swallow can be initiated. But nobody had fully understood what the importance of this piriform sinus was for cough. And so what we can see here is this is EMG tracing up here at the top. You can see the parasternal, so we're just looking here at eupnea, just rest breathing. And our thyropharyngeus, which controls the diameter of this piriform sinus, is expiratory phasic. And so right here where the tube is um, placed into the trachea to begin the mechanical stimulation, what you have is an immediate shutoff of any expiratory phasic activity from the thyropharyngeus. And then we have this significant increase of the cricopharyngeus. And this is controlling the tone of the upper esophageal sphincter. So what we see is a more complex um, control of the pharynx and the upper esophageal sphincter than was previously um, understood. So looking at the changes in cough, here we see a cough that's happening before a swallow and then a cough that's happening after a swallow. And so what we saw is that these post-swallow coughs, their amplitudes were significantly increased, especially abdominal drive. And we also see what is this, what um, Dr. Bolser calls um, E2. So this is the passive expiratory component of cough. So after you have your kind of um, abdominal burst, then you have this period that's kind of passive. And when a swallow occurs, one of the other things that we see is that this period is prolonged. So trying to put all of these um, results into some sort of mechanical and physiological context, um, I presented in the paper that we published this year this idea that there are dual valves controlling pressure regulation. So coming from the speech pathology world, the way I was learned um, to think about the vocal folds inside the larynx, that this is a valving system that open and closes and regulates pressure moving across from the trachea to the upper airway. But I'd like to suggest that the UES and the larynx, they work in concert. And so essentially you have two openings that pressure can move across, moving from the pharynx into the thorax. It can either go across the vocal folds or across the um, upper esophageal sphincter. And so what we see is that only one of these is open at a time. So during breathing, vocal folds are open, the UES is closed. During swallow, we see the reverse. The UES is allowed to open and the vocal folds are closed so that we don't have any leaking of pressure, so the pressure that's kind of generated either by upper airway muscles or muscles in the thorax, they can move um, whatever needs to be moved across the proper sphincter. Okay, so now we believe that cough and swallow, um, that these pattern generators are tightly coordinated um, and they act as this kind of meta behavior. We see that there is increased pharyngeal clearance um, with tracheal stimulation. So this tracheal feedback, we believe that tracheal feedback is actually um, informing the brainstem on the quality of the swallow. And so if you get significant tracheal feedback following a swallow, the brainstem is now notified that there was some sort of aspiration event that happened on that swallow. And so then we can have a response to that. So the larynx and the upper esophageal sphincters, that these two um, valving systems, they're, they're, they're acting together and they're controlling the direction of positive and or negative pressure from the upper airway into the thorax and then in reverse as well. Okay, so this is kind of moving on. So now we have a better idea about um, how cough and swallow are interacting. And so we're expanding the computer simulations that are going on. So this is computer simulation software that was developed at USF. Um, by uh, Bruce Lindsay and Kendall Morris. And so one of the first things that I wanted to do was to add um, some effects of short and long-term inhibition um, that afferents don't provide a super stable um, feed um, back to the brainstem, but it kind of can shift over time. And so I wanted to give us a better control of um, behavior excitability. And so, in 2011, this paper was published with the USF and UF group. Um, Ivan Polyacek was the lead author on this. But essentially, um, the way cough was modeled was there was a straight square wave second order afferent um, fiber input into the 
cough pattern generator, so what you got was a pretty straight line lumbar and phrenic output. But cough um, is actually not that way when you look at it in vivo. So this is um, some in vivo data. So this is repetitive coughing. And so what we see is this kind of bell-shaped curve where the first cough in the sequence is um, has the lowest amount of excitability. And then uh, to about the eighth or the ninth cough, then you have um, a higher amount of excitability, and then it can fall off over time. So the first aim of this um, project, which we're working on getting publishing now, was to create a more dynamic expiratory drive, especially during these successive coughs. So here's actually some numbers taken from some in vivo data averaging um, six animals over time. And so the first cough here is the lowest, and then these are um, t-tests looking and comparing to the first cough in the sequence. And you get um, to the fifth, sixth, seventh. This is when they start to get significantly larger than the first. And then it kind of um, shapes off over time. And so what I did was I added a feed-forward population, which um, had feed-forward inhibition onto the second-order population here. And so instead of modeling to have um, kind of this increasing excitability over time, I modeled it by having a decreasing inhibition over time. The other thing that we had to do is we had to really increase the number of terminals, the number of places that this population was interacting with this population to smooth out because we were, by having um, less um, terminals in the, in the actual simulation, we were getting this um, rapid change in excitability, and so the motor outputs weren't looking um, right. So one of the things that we now know from some recent um, publications is that this might actually be the case, is that as you move up in the processing population, you have more and more neurons which are responsible for processing some of this feedback in order to smooth out any rapid changes in excitability effects. And so the first kind of big change in simulation that we did, here's our second order population, here's our feed forward inhibition, and now we are getting some shaping on our lumbar drive, similar more to what we're seeing with in vivo. But when Ivan Poliacek looked at this, he had some problems with these E2 durations that were at the end. So one of the things that we know is that as excitability falls off, the interburst interval between these coughs should prolong. And so the first iteration, it did not prolong. And so one of the other, the next kind of goal of this project was to align the spatial, temporal, and motor drive features um, that look more like in vivo. So one of the first things that I had to do is I had to split the inspiratory and the expiratory drive, so creating um, these two divergent populations. And they have the same feed-forward inhibition onto both of these populations. And Dr. Bolster and Mutolo had kind of um, written some papers suggesting that there might be this differential control with cough by some work that was done in actual cough suppression. And so this hypothesis is out there. I just actually added it to the model that we're now currently using. Now, to give me more control over this E2 duration, the, the big relationship here are the, the neurons that are occurring at the very end of expiration. These would be the E augmenting lates. And then the neurons that are occurring right at the beginning of inspiration, which would be the IDEX, the I decrementing neurons. And so by modifying this um, reciprocal in inhibitory population, essentially how we have it now is that as the expiratory drive decreases, these, um, these intervals um, decrease as well, I mean increase. And so here was our previous model iteration, and now here we are where at the end of these simulations we are actually getting prolongation of um, E2. And so one of the reviews that we have been getting in some of our um, grants and publications is to 
to do more model specificity to have a better idea about how our model is actually aligning with what we see in vivo. And so this is one of um, the metrics that we're trying to use where we actually take um, the simulation and we add um, some variability within it by these random seed numbers that are a part of how the populations are built. And so you can run multiple model iterations, then taking actual um, duration and amplitude measures off of that and comparing them to what we see in vivo. So I took the pulley check model, which was published in that 2011 paper, and we're comparing all durations to total cough duration. And this is in vivo data. So you can see that the previous model did not align very well with the in vivo model. But this is our revised model, and so now if looking at the I and the E and the amplitude, we're looking much better. This model here now is comparing much better to what we actually have measured from in vivo. And so we're now um, kind of at a place where we can um, model some really significant dynamic features of in vivo repetitive cough. And so what we're what we're saying is that this kind of second order, potentially NTS, reticular formation area, is doing more than just relaying information, that it's processing. And so we're putting these processing circuits that move from the afferent, from the fiber input in, before you actually get to the motor drive. So this is some of the new stuff that we're working on. So now that we have a pretty good um, cough model, um, the point of the grant is to model cough and swallow in sequence. Um, we then had to really up our game on the swallow model. And so working with Christian Gestro and um, this last summer and Kendall Morris, we began to think about swallow being um, this inhibitory oscillator and then breathing being this inhibitory oscillator. And so could we combine these two mutually inhibitory oscillators and had them kind of oscillate between breathing and swallow? And so we've only loosely coupled them because it's essentially how you see it in human or see it in vivo that there's not this rigid relationship between, but it can actually be in flux. So how we built it was we had an inspiratory, expiratory, um, mutually inhibitory, mutually inhibitory oscillator, and then for lack of more creative terms, this A and B oscillator for swallow, where A is the actual execution of the swallow, and B is controlling the inter-swallow interval. And so this is some of the model outputs we actually Hypoglossal is um, how we're representing swallow. Phrenic is for breathing. And then we have lumbar down here. And so you can actually see that the swallow and breathing, that they are interacting in a way that looks a lot like how in vivo data looks. OK, so this is the other kind of new exciting thing that we're working on. We're trying to make the next step of our cough model is to translate it into human cough. and because humans and cats cough differently, we have to have some changes to our model. And so what you're looking at here is a Parkin no, this is a healthy patient. This is them producing a single cough, and this is a cough epic. So we have one inspiration here followed by compression, expulsion, compression, expulsion, compression, expulsion, two lower and lower lung volumes. And so all healthy controls can produce this pattern. We've run about 30 now. Um, this first airflow is normally the biggest, and then it reduces down. But here are two Parkinson's disease patients. And so their single coughs look relatively normal, but you ask them to cough like something stuck in their throat, and they begin to produce these kind of bizarre motor output patterns. So um, the physicians that work in Parkinson's disease, they call this like a like a gunshot, so it actually sounds like <laughs> where you have the same flow kind of across time here. And so the same oscillation doesn't actually work. This inspiratory, expiratory oscillation doesn't work in this um, human model. And so this fall, what I've been working on is creating this um, dual oscillating model of human cough. OK, so here on the left is the way the model looks in the simulation environment, where 
red circles are excitatory and these um, yellow orange boxes are inhibitory. And so here you have your primary oscillator which is inspiration, expiration. This is how breathing is working. Um, and then as we move into cough, this primary expiratory oscillator moves down into this expiratory A and expiratory B, where this is compression, laryngeal closure, and expiratory B is expulsion or lumbar drive. And so to make this expiratory A and B not participate during breathing, um, what I created was this inhibitory population that essentially inhibits these during um, eupnea or breathing drive. And then as cough comes along, we disinhibit this and allows for A and B to um, oscillate with this population controlling the overall expiratory duration. So now if we look over here, we have breathing and then we have these series of um, compression, expulsion, compression, expulsion, compression, expulsion. We have this next big inspiratory and then we have another series of compression, expulsion. So it's looking more like what human cough would look like. So then the next thing, the next idea or the next kind of thing that I've been working on is through this model that we've developed that I just showed you, can we make the model produce things that look more like PD cough? So we have this secondary oscillator that's oscillating um, using mutual inhibition between compression and expulsion. So you, we have this secondary oscillator and if you reduce the excitability that goes to it, it will oscillate faster. And so my hypothesis for this PD cough is that as excitability is reduced in the um, NTS, reticular formation, um, and then the brainstem control of the breathing, that what you get is more rapid oscillation of the secondary oscillator. And so that's kind of how we're beginning to approach modeling um, this PD cough. So that's it. That's what I have. Hopefully there's some questions. And I just want to also thank the collaborators here at UF and then at USF. So thanks for your time. Thank you, Teresa. It was a wonderful presentation. Um, we're opening up uh, the floor to questions. I, um, I, I have the question, is this possible is it possible that this model can be related uh, to the problem of apnea? Yeah, I mean, we are, um, Bruce Lindsay has done some apnea work modeling, um, taking the model to hyperventilation and getting um, apnea, and then also varying uh, varying input into either the inspiratory or the expiratory side of the model. And so you can model apnea a couple of different ways within like the original model iterations. Great, and even thank you. New so I, I think they've published some of that for control of apnea and, and apneusis through, through this model from, from their primary work um, on the model creation. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Herman. Ahmed actually has three questions for you. Uh, too bad he can't speak them, but I'll, I'll ask each question um, separately. So the first question is, do the modeling workflow allow association of muscular dysfunction with cough swallow parameters? I assume this is part of the relationship between motor drive and airflow. Yeah, so one of the things that we're doing that we just started, this next grant is going to be on, is taking Parkinson's disease patients that are at multiple stages of the disease and getting swallow metrics on them, getting um, EMG and airflow, and finding the parameters in the PD patients that best predict changes in airway protection. And then we're also creating an in vivo model of um, disordered airway protection by doing some microinjections in the NTS and the medial articular formation. Then we're going to do the same exact measurements on those animals. 
and then at the same time creating these alterations in the computational model. And all of these are going to be fed into these um, logarithmic equations for prediction of degree of impairment. And so kind of the next step is to really make it translational. Um, one of the hard things in Parkinson's disease is that as you move along in the stages, the amount of patients you can get your hands on um, gets less and less. And so what we're hoping is that the computational model can feed in um, smaller changes of the, in impairment um, to fill out a data set to look more complete, make it more predictive, essentially. So okay, we're trying to test all of these things. <laughs> and Bruce Lindsay has made the model actually produce airflows now. We showed that at Experimental Biology, and they published that this year. So um, Russell O'Connor actually fed in human mechanics of breathing, and so now you can take the integrated um, drive from the phrenic abdominal, abdominal and the laryngeal, and it will actually produce airflows that look like human cough. So we're working on that aspect as well. Okay, Ahmed, second question is, is it possible to add another dimension to this research program to explore the links between cough characteristics and stress incontinence, in other words, involuntary urination? I think cough is used for that, um, and there was somebody in the cough world that was trying to relate those things together, and I think that Don had done some work on urinary sphincter, but at this point, we don't have anything that's kind of moving, you know, in that direction anytime soon. But if you have some data you want to share, I'm sure we could <laughs> put it in the model. Okay, great. Um, and and um, the third question is, where in the modeling and simulation framework evaluation of interventions can fit in? So I think that when you vary excitability, if you believe that your intervention is, one, increasing afferent input in, it can be changed through the fiber. Secondly, if you believe that your intervention is increasing strength of the muscles, let's say, um, then you can change how the drive actually affects airflow modification. So if we understand the mechanism of action, we can model that pretty easily by changing how the model kind of interacts and then um, essentially make simulations along that along that line and then look to see if they actually um, can predict what the humans would look like having gone through the same intervention. Okay, great. And Ahmed says, thank you for the insightful presentation. Thank you. <laughs> so I have a question, Teresa. It, it seems that this area is not a very large area of researchers. I mean, how many groups are, are modeling often as well? We, we are the only ones. Yeah, you, between USF and UF, we're the, the, that, that model of swallow is the first one that I know of that anybody even attempted or tried to model swallow with breathing. So that, that would be the first one ever, actually. And then the, the cough has been published on, but it's all in the same, it's all in the same group. Yeah. So according to Gordon. Yeah, we're small, but we're like, we're moving along. <laughs> Steady Freddy, as they say. But we would love people to, to join, I think, um, that's just, even when you look at the number of people in the world that are even researching cough, we could fit in a pretty small conference room as well. Yeah, I, I would sense that there would be a lot of different applications for your model. Um, at NIH, there's a dysphagia group that might be interested in, you know, yeah. for different types of uh, diseases that affect um, speech and swallow mm -hmm. and different diseases that affect the tongue and that sort of thing. So We um, additionally am collaborating um, with a physical therapist that looks at Pompe disease, which is a pretty rare um, glycogen storing disease. And so we're trying, we now have some nice 
um, measurements pre and post a treatment, trying to see if the model can predict the changes that those kids make as well. So we're, we're trying to kind of get out and get some um, novel clinical data to see if the model can um, predict those changes. Yeah, it'd be great if, if once you're comfortable, I mean, you should um, maybe post your model on the, the index for predictive models on the IMAG wiki. And okay. that way we can help spread the word on the types of models you're developing to let other researchers and clinicians know about your model, even if they're not using models at all. Okay, I'll email you later about how to get all of that done. I would love great. that. Okay, super. Are there any other questions? If not, um, I will adjourn the call. And thank you very much, Teresa, for your wonderful presentation. Appreciate it.